keep the boat going because of history, you know, for history's sake. And, you know, it'll be a terrific boat when it's, when it's in great shape. But it's had some problems, really, over the years. And repair jobs and all kinds of things go on with boats like this. It's pretty much normal, but it's hard to get a really good repair job done by anybody because they, they require all kinds of understanding. And there's things you can't glue and things you can glue. And, you know, so... You know, it's about been repaired enough. You know, it's time. Yeah, over over the over the course of the, I've had the boat for thirty years, and over the course of that, there's been a lot of work done to it. So there's been replaced frames, the cockpit has been rebuilt, there's been replaced floors, floors. So there has been a lot of work done, and the deck's been kept in good shape, so it's never leaked. But sooner or later, you find something if it's when something's eighty-four years old that just isn't right anymore. And in this case, we found a piece that isn't my, right. In my viewpoint on boats like this is that uh, you know a lot of people accept sailing around doing a little leaking as long as the pump keeps up with it. But situations like this be, could become an emergency in no time flat, especially if you were in any kind of weather. You know, because that keel could split. You know, it's already split right down the middle. You know, so. You know, that has to be replaced. That's all there is to it. Well, and that's why we're here, because this is one of the biggest jobs. It means being out of the water for quite a while, but it was time to, it was time to do it. And we're going to show you some of the reasons why it was particularly bad in some places, but overall, it needs to be replaced. Well, I wanted to show you this ballast block that's sitting out in the yard here. This is the ballast block that's going under the brand new keel that we put in the boat. and. Uh, it's a pretty good sized ballast block for the size of the boat, Ken. Uh, you know, I know it's not lead, but boy, it's giant. It's uh, 6,500 pounds of iron. 5,500 pounds. 6,500 pounds. 6,500 pounds. If it was lead, it'd probably be what? 12,000. Oh. You know? <laughs> yeah, it was Something the like same that, size, but, yeah. You know? So. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's quite a hunk. And the wood keel was no longer able to support it. You know, as it tipped, you know, as the boat rolled, the, 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 the keel was actually rocking back and forth, changing its relationship to the hull. So, you know, that's pretty dangerous. It could actually come off of there in the right weather. So, you know, it was time. And here it is. So with it, with it taking it off is something um, to get it out because it's held on with these stainless steel. It was held on with these stainless steel bolts mm. that run down inside and then that's nutted on the bottom to hold it to hold it up. Mm -hmm. So fortunately, I didn't do most of the work pushing them out. We pushed the boat. We took the nut off the bottom and pushed the boat up. And fortunately, I didn't have to do it because my daughter and a friend of hers from high school spent probably about three weeks pushing <laughs> bolts out, knocking the bung out of the out of the iron keel and getting to the top of it, and then putting a 20-ton jack underneath it and pushing the bolt out from the bottom. Yeah. Um, and, in that, and then, to do it, what are you going to do once you get all the bolts out of it? You need something to hold it. So yeah. we built this sled out of six by sixes so we could drop the ballast block in the, in, in the sled and then drag it out from underneath and get it out of the way. Yeah. It's a pretty nice sled here that Ken's built because uh, it's got plenty of support and, uh, you know, it's kind of a standard thing other than that. You know, we got a couple of staging planks on the ground here and we got pipe rollers in between it. So it rolls, you know, so it and uh, it's going to roll right back in again. You know, we had to support the boat completely without supporting the keel. So, you know, or the ballast block. So, you know, there's the boat just hanging there. We got a couple of stands at the keel right now, but those are going to go because you know we're going to pull the keel out. We take the so piece. The, the boat's you know supported by the poppet stands, and uh, you know I think it's fine. It doesn't show any caving at the stands, you know, like pushing no, the frames. No, it stayed around. pretty well. Yeah, it stayed pretty, pretty well, and it hasn't moved. It lasted yeah. all winter with a cover yeah. on it. It yeah. didn't blow over. Yeah. So what are these? That's seven a eighths of an inch. Seven eighths yeah. stainless steel. I'm gonna bolts. say they don't look quite an inch. Yeah. yeah. So they yeah. were replaced. I'm guessing that they were replaced about 40 years ago. I've had the boat for 30 years. I'd say 40, 45 years. They took the old iron bolts out. Yeah. It was um, iron to begin with. Yeah. yeah. And then and then put these in. They also at the time they replaced the floors. They redid the floors. So so the floors are still those floors are still in pretty good shape. And the boat, surprisingly, you know, held held together real well, except for the last few years. When I bought it 30 years ago, there was dust in the bilge. It was wet stored. 
held out for a couple of weeks to do work and it was dust, but it wasn't dust anymore. No, it was, but it wasn't It wasn't in great shape even then when it had dust in the build, was it? No, I mean, well, those repair jobs that was 30 years ago. All that. Well, it was 30 years ago, Lou. I don't know if I yeah, remember. I, uh, uh, <laughs> so yeah. to me, it was in amazing shape. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so if we're done, if we show you this, we'll show you how, what probably did the most damage to the keel besides age. So, so we're here with the, uh, the deadwood that's part of the aft of the ballast keel. You can see it's cut at an angle, so the ballast keel sits under the keel there, and then the deadwood sits all the way to the stern of the boat. So for years, I've wanted to do this because I knew it wasn't right to begin with. They'd sandwich two pieces of wood together like this. Now, I knew that wasn't the right way to do it, but I didn't realize what the even bigger problem was for doing that. And that is they took the old iron bolts that, bolts that were hanging down from the knee and they left them in. And they just pushed the two halves together like this and then tried to make it tight by bolting it through on the sides. One, one side to the two pieces together, together. from each side. Yeah. 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 So you want to talk about this? Yeah, well. Yeah. You know, I mean, obviously it was a repair job, and, and it's dead wood, like, like Ken said. And I think the reason why they call it dead wood is that it doesn't aid the structure at right. all. It's, it's just a dead piece by itself, you know. But it, it extends down from the keel, and like Ken said, it's, a, it's aft of the keel, and it, so it fares in, and the rudder is back here. The heel fitting would be back in here, actually, but uh, the heel fitting would be on this piece right here. You can see where the rudder kind of came into it right here. And, uh, you know, so there's three pieces here. Uh, look at the amount of bolt holes and stuff in it. I mean, there doesn't seem to be any regard for, uh, you know, proper <laughs> bolting or anything like that, you know. And uh, like Ken said also, that these two pieces, are, it's made of two pieces, one on each side. Rather than putting one piece and putting the bolts down to it, they probably couldn't do that, or they weren't willing to drive those they, bolts they, out they of the way. They weren't going to drive them you know, out. So, you know, you, repair you work like this, like I say, uh, it requires a lot of very good decisions, not just decisions. Otherwise, when you're done working, it's not repaired. You know, so show them the bolts that came out. Sure. Oh, were, These are some of the keel bolts, or, or the floor timber bolts right here. Look at the deterioration. They're right down to a point. You know, and they're, they're iron. You know, there's no doubt that uh, the iron goes after a certain amount of years and you're faced with a decision as to what you're going to do, stainless steel or bronze, or iron again. Or iron you again, know? yeah. Iron's strong as can be. It just doesn't last forever, but I, I would tell you, if you bolted it on with iron bolts, it'd probably be good for like 100 years, well, maybe. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, so, those are 84, yeah. so maybe yeah. not 100. You know, and the cost, but <laughs> yeah. I guess this is all going to be done with bronze. We did a repair job to this ourselves quite some time ago yeah. when we knew that this thing was put it on in two pieces, you know, and had a lot of deterioration back aft, and we cut into it like a mortise and put a piece in there like that, you know, so that's just the head of the rudder, this round part right here. But, you know, this thing was rotten, it was wet, it was everything, and, you know, you're stuck trying to figure out what are you going to do. You know, the glue that we put in there is like epoxy, but you can see it here, it's stuck to the piece, but a lot of places it, it just came right off. And uh, we didn't really figure it's gonna be glued in there. It just, the glue just took up the space. It's just really, basically, you know? yeah. And uh, you know, well, it did the job for a number of a, years. A stopgap measure to keep it from leaking up the bolts in the stern of the boat. So, yeah. but then when this came off, it became clear it wasn't just a matter of replacing deadwood. It was a matter of replacing the wood keel. It's amazing to me, the more I look at it, that uh, we've had it out and we looked at it, but the more I look at it, this side stayed glued from here all the way down to here. Yep. You know, it's ripped the grain right off. And even though that was wet when we did that, it stuck. You know, yeah. epoxy glue, <laughs> uh, especially what I like to use, two to one epoxy glue. It sticks amazingly yeah. to wet wood and everything else. We didn't have the same luck on this side, but you know, that's pretty yeah. lucky, really. Ten, ten years. Ten years. <laughs> ten years of luck, yeah. yeah. And Ken and I put some planks in it uh, quite a few years ago as well. So, and as a matter of fact, that's how we met. 
working on this boat. Working right on here. this boat. The man who knew more about the boat than I did. <laughs> well, you know, I did have a little more experience, I guess. But, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, so. it's always fun for me to see people like yourself get involved with this kind of work. You know, because yeah. it just isn't enough of it, in my estimation. No, Wooden boats not. or people that can work on them. Well, properly. you know, I think I may have mentioned it earlier, but there's, they built around 40 of these. This was hull number four. And as far as I know, there's only one, one other one left, and that was in Portugal. I don't know what kind of shape it's in, but there used to be a few around here, but not, I don't think anymore. So, but if you have, if you have a 675 Alden, or you know one, let me know. Go to bristolshiprights.com and, and send me a note, at, because I'd love to see if there's another one or another few around. So then, when you want, I'm gonna let Lou take you through what's been done to this and why and the rest of it. But just before we start, it's just, you know, what makes a boat worth saving, there's a lot of reasons. But when then you do want to save the boat and you want to put maybe another 40, 50 years in it, you got to find something like this. So when you want to find something like this, it's real true quick, a salva. It's four inches, four and a quarter thick. It's 27 inches across. It's sawn, it's sawn clear of the heart. Um, it's not quarter sawn, but it's clear of the heart. So if you need a piece of wood like that, then the, really the guy you need to talk to is Duke Bezozzi no, at New England Naval Timbers. Absolutely. He's, he's got an amazing operation and he's, he's just a wonderful guy to deal with. So part of, the, part of the fun of this actually, that wasn't so fun, was driving out there with my friend AJ here, Fatty's Garage, <laughs> and sitting in an old Kenworth truck for five, six, seven hours, <laughs> and going to Duke's and picking this up. And I told him what I wanted back in November and um, it's obvious that it's obvious that he listened to what I had to say, and and you know waited till he had a, a, a butt log that he thought would be good for what I wanted. Yeah, it's it, it's great dealing with with Duke because he understands what these pieces of wood are going for. You know, he he basically tries to cut nothing but lumber for marine use. Yeah, that's what he right? does. And, uh, yeah, you know, he doesn't really cut anything but quercusalba, white yeah. oak. You yeah. know, and. Uh, this is a real nice piece. I've been buying lumber from Duke for 40 years, maybe 45 years. Yeah. So I, he's so consistent, it's unbelievable. Yeah. You put your order in, this is what you get. Uh, now, I want to show you some things about yeah, this. Yeah, I'm going to let Lou finish up with that and say that. To, and the same with all the guys that work for him, too. Jimmy now, he's got a Sawyer who's just tremendous, and Al, who's his, basically his brother, who's been with him forever. When you it's, go there, you have fun. It's, it's not just it's like a... A day know, in the woods. Yeah, it's and some fantastic. And a beautiful trout stream right nearby. Yeah. So, all right, I'm going to let Lou all take right. you through this. So, well, obviously, this is the piece that's going to replace the keel. And, uh, you know... Uh, on the schooner that we're building, we have a quarter sawn keel in there, which is, you know, highly desirable, actually, because a quartered section like this section over here or that section over there, you can see it has very little tendency to check. If it did, it'd be checking from the side in like this. Then they're talking about this area. But the thinner the piece is, the less uh, power it's got to open itself up like in a check like that as it dries. But, uh, you know, where it slabs on in the middle, you can see this checking right here. That's basically the problem with a slab on keel is, is that, you know, if it's not an awfully select piece of material or it's got the heart in it, you know, it's, you know, it, it goes together nice, but it doesn't stay that way. You know, so, you know, the worst thing you can have is these checks on the top of the keel because it'll make the keel open up and water gets in there when there's fresh water in the boat like rain water and different things and it freezes and it opens things up and uh, you know freezing water has all kinds of power they split granite and stone and everything with freezing water you know so it has a big effect on it this is a nice piece because it is clear of the heart and uh, the checks don't line up with each other like they do at the butt end of the log. The butt end of the log is, uh, you know, especially with a tree this big, has a tendency to want to split open as it dries at the butt, you know. And uh, the other thing I can say is that uh, these checks, you know, all I, I said it's clear of the hot, and it is clear of the hot, but this is the closest wood to the hot right here. This is what they would call, well, it's alongside the pith. It's not the pith, but the pith is where 
the nutrients come up through the center of the tree and then they it emanates out on the medullary rays to the growth rings so you know we're stuck with a with a slab sawn keel and I, I don't think it's that bad because of the quality of the piece you know most every boat you've ever seen this size or the size of the schooner we're building or any boat usually has a slab sawn keel like this i wanted to tell you how i went about actually flattening this thing out and checking it out. Well, I used a very small electric plane because I can move the plane around much faster than a big giant one, you know? And uh, actually, I use the plane a quite a bit different than most people do. You know, I just swish it around in all kinds of different directions and I'm not trying to take off an awful lot. I'm trying to take off a very small amount. And uh, there's just different things about those electric planes. I mean, you know, we know there's humps and bumps where the, where the blade wandered a little tiny bit. This would be a low spot and this spot's higher. So you can just look at it and tell that. So, you know, you go over that with a plane and you can feel it. You know, you can feel it under the plane. It's amazing. It's just like feeling it with your hand. The plane kind of rocks like this over those things. And, uh, you know, it, um, the other thing is you can hear it because when it gets to this point, it's hardly cutting. Then all of a sudden it's cutting over here. So you have numbers of different checks, visual, you know, I, I don't know what you call it, audio, right? And feeling in your hands, at least those three, you know, and uh, one of the other things we did, uh, that's the tool I use, but I also, to get it nice and flat and discover where all the bumps were, when we got down into the thousandths of an inch of discrepancy, Right? What we did was you take a two foot level and you can check it across, you know, just to see if it's got space. You know, if it's touching somewhere, you'll actually be able to rock the level a little bit or one end stays down and the other end is up. It depends on the shape. But, you know, by looking at it and touching it, you can tell how straight it is across. That's one thing we've done. But on top of that, we took a six foot aluminum level and on one side of it, you take a magic marker and you kind of, you know, just darken up one side with magic marker right on top of the aluminum. Well, the magic marker dries out pretty quickly, but the pigmentation is still on the level. So you can put the level down and swish it all over the place. And all it does is touch the high spots. You know, so, you know, we plane it a little bit more, check it for feel, you know, check it, you know, all kinds of different ways, pick up the, the uh, level again and do it again, you know? And once we've taken care of that, we do it again, you know? And uh, we just keep doing it until we're convinced that there's no lumps left in it whatsoever. And we're gonna check it across, and we're gonna check it longitudinally with the very large level to see if it's got any lumps in it this way. So, I mean, you know, it's pretty comprehensive and I, I don't think it's something a lot of people would want to do. You know, I, I, I use an electric plane in a lot different way than most people do. And this is the result of it right here. And uh, I wanted to show you a few things while I'm here. You know, we talked about the deadwood. The deadwood is a piece of wood that's underneath the keel back here. You know, just to continue the shape of the bottom of the ballast block. You know, and it's down here somewhere like that. So, you know, it, uh, it's had its problems. And we said it was split right down the middle or put in in two pieces is actually what it was. So, you know, that wasn't quite right. And uh, there's a lot of electrolysis damage around in this area right here. You know, uh, the electrolysis comes from, you know, dissimilar metals and all kinds of stuff. I could go on and on about that. but. There's a big giant cavity under here in the middle that electrolysis has caused, you know, and uh, let me show you. I'm going to put a rule up in it. There it goes. It's, uh, it's four and a half inches. Well, no, it's four inches up. So it's got a cavity two inches wide and four inches deep all the way up to the knee, you know, that's bolted between the stern post and, and the keel. So, you know, I think Ken just was thinking maybe this keel could be saved and everybody would love to think that, but it couldn't be, you know. So, you know, uh, some of the other repairs that are going on over the years were this piece here, it's like a, it's like a piece that spans the gap between the keel and the stern post. Well, 
you know, it actually is pretty good. Of all the repair jobs on the boat, that one looks the best right there. It even looks better than the one Ken and I put back aft, and it's never failed, so, you know, it's pretty cool. When we put the keel in, you know, we want to take care of all the problems in the end of the stern post and right here all at the same time. But the stern post itself is in great shape, really, you know, except for the very bottom. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut this knee off like this, maybe four inches up. And we're going to put another piece on top of the keel. And we're going to cut the stern post off up there, too. And then we're probably going to put a mortise and tenon in there, where you're going to have a tenon on the end of the stern post, maybe more than this, mortise than to this. But the, the boat is narrow back there. So if you did it, you'd have to have a very conservative uh, thickness to that uh, tenon. So, you know, that's just a decision we have to make yet. The other thing that can be done, and you don't see it very often, is to put a bolt you know, that goes up through here, you know, from the, from the bottom here up to a, a, a hole in here where you put the nut. And that would be nice, you know, to keep this closed up really tight. And of course, it's going to be all rebolted in here. And, uh, you know, we're going to try to make sense of that, try to make it come out so it, you know, not just a mess. And, uh, you know, I wanted to show you some other things about it. The, uh, the keel itself, uh, has some shape problems. I don't think it's something that that uh, happened after the boat was built or some kind of deterioration. This side of the keel is a different shape than the other side of the keel. This one's got like a nice rounded shape to it and it, it really looks great if you sight it from back aft. But the other side's got like a straight section to it. So we put a wire right up the middle of the boat uh, and tighten it right up nice and tight so you can get dimensions from one side to the other. So, you know, in places back aft here, when you measure from the wire to here, you know, say it's six inches. When you measure from the wire to the other side, it'd be like five and five eighths or something. So it's three eighths of an inch off of shape. So we have to account for that when we cut the new keel and uh, we'll shape it properly. And uh, it's funny, all the floor timbers, or a lot of the floor timbers that were put in over the years have been shimmed, right? Because, you know, it, it, the hollow part in the keel, you know, or the floor timber just didn't fit. So we don't have any problem with that. You know, if we change the shape of the keel a little bit, well, we'll just put a couple shims and that'll be the end of it. And of course, you know, put new garbage planks in it and everything, but, um, you know, it's got quite a bit of deterioration. Let's go up forward. I'll show you a few more things. Well, up forward here, I, I wanted to show you another repair job that was done over the years. It really came out pretty good, too, and it's, it hung in there. So, you know, there's a four-foot piece right in here, you know, where I, I imagine it was put in because the keel was split right down the middle. So they had to do something about that. And it was probably all chewed up. It could have even been an accident or a grounding or something like that. I don't know exactly why they put that piece in, but uh, our piece is gonna be a little different. They're still gonna have a Dutchman in here because the top of the keel right here is gonna extend out right to about here. So it's gonna have a very tiny, small Dutchman in here. And it'll be four inches because uh, the end grain of the keel comes right to the shape of the boat. You know, and uh, the only other thing I would like to talk about right here is, you know, we're going to transfer the shape of this keel onto that piece of wood right there. And uh, after we do that, you know, with widths at certain stations, we have to establish some stations. They could be anywhere so we can transfer the width measurements on to this piece over here from the center line. We're taking them from the center line over here, and we're going to transfer them to the center line over there, or from the center line. And uh, the other thing is, is that for the widths, we're going to measure it. The width of the keel really is right at the rabbit line, because you know it doesn't have the keel running out. It had a fairly narrow uh, piece of wood for the dimensions of the rabbit, and uh, you know it's straight up. So all we have to do is take these widths and we're going to transfer them onto that piece. And then we're going to put a batten through it and correct it, you know, correct it a little bit so let's not have that funny shape from one side to the other, you know, because we're going to make it symmetrical. That's what we want to do. And, uh, you know, the other thing is, is that cutting this out, I'm going to cut it out right to the line because I don't expect it to edge set at all. And if it did, we could, we could bend it back 
You know, so whether it edge sets or not, it isn't going to edge set enough to bother us a single bit. And I'm going to cut it out with uh, a, a, a circular saw. Now, I don't want to call it a skill saw. It's a circular saw. Uh, I'm going to cut it right on the line, but I'm going to follow a batten so that the skill saw doesn't, you know, wander like this even a little bit because it kills the power. If you keep it right on the batten nice and straight, you get all kinds of power. I'm going to cut it down maybe an inch, then I'm going to cut it down two inches, then I'm going to cut it down three inches, and then I'm going to cut it down to four inches. You know, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty simple. It doesn't take a lot of power. It's much easier than you might think. Yeah, go ahead. You start. You start. You know, Ken and I get along pretty good on, uh, agree on most matters, but every once in a while we just come to an impasse, I guess you might call it, and uh, we have to go over to the conference table and have a little, have a little chat. argument and see if we can't both compromise, but, you know, uh, Ken, uh, you know, I don't understand what you're doing over here. You know, you should be working on the schooner, don't oh, you think? I should be working on the schooner. 30, I think you should 30 be 30 years of my life, I should just walk away. What, are you going to get a chainsaw? I, I, I will do it with a chainsaw. <laughs> you know what I mean? Chainsaw. You know, maybe we could get something off of it. We could use it again. Oh, cordwood. A hole fit what, is, what is the price of cordwood these days? Uh, well, <laughs> no, but I don't think they'll let you burn it with the bottom paint on it. No, I don't think you know? so, Lou. Well, you know. <laughs> You Let's know go back and work on the schooner and just let that thing hang well, out. Maybe what we could do is dig a hole and bury it and use it as a swimming pool. I like that idea. <laughs> I do. My wife would leave me and my daughter would never speak to me. <laughs> <laughs> Too much. Well, so I think we'll do both. I, I don't know. We'll... I, you know. I don't know who's going to win this the argument right here that we're going to yeah. have about what boat we're supposed to be working on. Yeah. But. Well, I guess the winner's going to get the scotch, right? The Is winner's going to get the winner's going to get the scotch. <laughs> right. Maybe we could get Tom to pour it for us. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I'll tell you, I'm over this argument we're having. I'm yeah. glad you're this far away. Oh, well.